Is that the first slide, Lindsay? No, I clicked okay. it by accident. So, I mean, yes, it is. This is the cover page. But okay. um, all right. So anyway, for the people that are here, um, I think what we decided to do was um, if you have questions kind of throughout, just type them in the chat box. And Jenny is here. She'll kind of take the questions down, make note of them. And then at the end, we will answer questions. Um, Tiffany, Amelia, myself, or Sue, or um, uh, we'll go through the questions and answer everything that kind of comes up as we go along. That way we're not kind of stopping in the middle. Um, but basically, this is our Puppy Foster webinar, which I'm super excited about because uh, I think there's a lot of information that I wish more new people were here to see this, but hopefully they'll pop in soon. Um, but we can go through why it's important to foster puppies. Uh, and one of the main reasons, and if Tiffany and Amelia have anything to kind of interject as I go along, please do. Uh, but one of the main reasons we foster puppies is because it's such a critical time in their life. So we want to make sure that they're not spending that time in the kennels, you know, kind of in a stressful environment and they're able to get out into homes. And also it's not very healthy for them to be in the kennels because there's a lot of diseases going around and a lot of things that they're pretty susceptible to at such a young age, especially since they're not fully vaccinated yet. Uh, so they are babies, you know, we want to take care of them. We want to treat them like babies and we don't want them to sit in the back in a metal cage and just be interacted with once or twice a day. Um, I wonder if there's a way that I can turn off the waiting room so people can, uh, there we go. Can you admit them, Wendy? Or yeah, I just, I just turned off the waiting room. So they'll just kind of pop in on their own. Okay. Um, but basically, uh, and then Lisa's shameless volunteer plug was that if you can't foster puppies, definitely look into signing up for being a puppy socializer because if, yeah. they, can't get out, <laughs> uh, if they can't get out of the uh, back room, you know, it's still good for them to have those interactions. So we want to, you know, do everything we can to help give these little guys a start to life. And then on that note, I'm going to pass it over to Sue, who's going to talk about getting started. Hi, everybody. Uh, um, I'm laughing because Sammy and one of the puppies is up there, one of my uh, foster puppies. The first thing I think for me when I bring the puppies in, which is I think the most stressful part of the whole introduction into the home, is I just I have a little pen set up with separate gates and I just take the crate and put it right in there. So the introduction to the resident pets, they see that pen come up and they know that the puppies are coming. And uh, because I don't allow any face-to-face -face in the first few days, just because, you know, we're trying to get everybody used to it and um, just for safety and everything's set up in the pen. There's no plants near there. There's no uh, wires or anything that they can get into. Um, and then I have all the puppy supplies in there. So it's a smooth transition. So my guys, uh, they're so used to it now that when the pen gets put up, the crate gets put in, they, they know that's the routine. So that's probably the most important part is, uh, however, the introductions, I don't introduce the, the puppies to my guys until a few days later. And they just see them, they see them in the pen and it's, it ends up being a very smooth transition. So. That's it, Linz. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, the only other thing that I want to add to that is just be wary of things around your house that puppies can get into. Uh, they are puppies, so they get into a lot of stuff. So loose wires, shoes hanging around, just manage it. It makes it easier to uh, prevent problems if you <laughs> manage the situation and just don't have those things out and available for puppies to accidentally eat. Um, so with puppy training, uh, Providence Animal Center as a whole is 
uh, positive reinforcement based. So uh, if you're familiar with the dogs in the kennels, or if you've come to any of Carolyn's uh, foster, sorry, kennel dog uh, sessions or anything along those lines, you will learn that we we do everything we can not to punish our dogs. Uh, same goes for fosters. We don't wanna use any type of harsh tools on them. We don't wanna use techniques that scare or startle them. We really wanna do things as positively as possible to make their life uh, better because who wants to be punished? It's not fun. So the premise of it is, is that if you see my little chart in the corner here, Positive reinforcement is anything added to the situation to increase a behavior that you like. Uh, whereas punishment is going to add something that's going to make the behavior stop. But if you do more things that make a behavior that you like happen more often, there's less likely of an opportunity that you're going to have to punish a behavior that you don't like. Um, they do have many studies that using punishment and discipline can come with a lot of risks, such as fear, anxiety, and stress. And it also associates negative feelings towards the person who's doing the punishing. Uh, you want to build your relationship with the puppy. You want puppies to build relationships with people in general that are positive and fun. Uh, so on an example like that, if puppy's biting, you don't wanna smack the puppy on the nose. You don't wanna yell at the puppy. You wanna give the puppy a toy and say, hey, this is what I want you to do instead. If you're playing with the toy, then we can have fun together and we can play a game. Uh, you want to capture good behavior, which is you know, adding those positive things during things that you like. Uh, and an example that we have is that if puppy is chewing on a toy nicely and you didn't ask puppy to do that, then you can just drop some treats in front of the puppy while he's sitting there or she's sitting there and chewing the toy. And then puppy learns when I'm quietly chewing on my toy on my bed, good things happen. So the result would be, I'm, I'm going to do this more often. Um, so... That's kind of the training aspect of it. We can go into more detail, but we could talk about that for hours on end and okay. we won't get to the next slide. Uh, so I will pass again to Sue about potty training puppies. I guess the first question, uh, you know, is, is it possible to train? I have six week old puppies often and is it possible to potty train them? Definitely. Uh, um, really it's timing. So when I have the, the, you know, especially the six week old puppies, as soon as they get up, I take them out. Uh, as soon as they're, they've been playing or it's been about 20 minutes, I take them outside. I reward them. I usually have treats in my pocket all the time so that if they, as soon as they go, I give them a reward for that. And it totally, they totally start to get into a rhythm with it. So it's the routine and the consistency. Uh, they know every time they get up, they go out. Um, and it's most important to take them, uh, you know, outside because they get used to the outdoors. They get used to the feel of the grass because they're used to the, the pee pads, which they also use. Um, and then, you know, when, when I do take them outside and put them on the floor, if they have an accident, I just ignore that. I never punish them for, you know, having an accident, obviously, in the house. Um, and then as, as soon as I have them outside and they've been out for about 20 minutes or whatever, and I bring them back in, uh, it's just then things are just calm in there in, in the pen and they start to play again. And I usually, if I am here, every 20 minutes or so, I try to get them outside, um, especially after they've been playing and playing roughly. Uh, and again, as soon as you get them in that routine, it's almost as if they understand that. And, and some of the puppies, even as young as six, seven weeks, will start to jump up on the, the pen like they need to go out. So it's amazing. As long as the positive reinforcement is there, it's really quite easy. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I, I think I've only had one puppy in the years who just didn't quite click with the potty <laughs> training. But um, most of them really do get it really quickly and at such a young age, which always surprises me that, you know, a 10 week old puppy or an eight week old puppy 
many times will ask to go outside and it's just <laughs> when you do it with those rewards they they want to pee in the grass they don't want to pee inside um and that kind of all goes back to capturing that good behavior and when it's something that you want and they're peeing outside you you know give them lots of treats um so the only other thing about that is that if you do find an accident in the house and you didn't see it happen at that point there's nothing that you can do about it you can't tell the puppy that he didn't did something wrong uh you the only thing you can do is clean it up and move on uh, the opportunity for the puppy to learn that that was not what you want is gone. They won't associate, you know, pottying in the corner 20 minutes later with you saying no bad dog. Um, so the best thing to do is just clean it up and move on. Lindsay, can I ask um, about while the accident is happening? I know you gave me good advice on that before. I think that's something like if you know the puppy's going and about to have an accident, do you pick pick up the puppy and take them outside? Uh, Sue, what do you do? Yeah, absolutely, Jenny. I know you get to know their behavior. And as soon as they start circling around there, they're yeah. not paying attention to anything else but finding a spot. I always lift them up and put them down, okay. take them outside. Absolutely. They usually give you a cue right before. Uh, if you catch it, it's awesome because they will go as soon as you take them out. It's a great question. Yeah, and it's funny because each individual puppy does have their own little signs that you're like, oh, I know what you're doing. But <laughs> if I do catch them, like while they're pooping, I have picked up a puppy like mid poop and put them right on the grass. I don't do anything about the poop inside. If like a nugget falls, I just leave it there and I'll go right out to the grass. And when they finish, I'll praise and, and I'll, you know, yay, yay, yay. If I get it while they're doing it. Um, but again, I don't startle them. I don't clap my hands. I don't say no, 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 while they're doing it. Or I try my best not to, we're all human. It's really hard not to. Um, but if you startle them, what you can do is you can actually associate going to the bathroom in front of you as a scary thing. And you don't want them to go and hide in the corner and go potty and you never know. Does that make sense? <laughs> um, okay, so the next slide is body handling. Um, I'm, you know, kind of a big proponent on body handling, not just for our puppy friends, but for dogs in general. We really do want to respect the boundaries of our, you know, canine and feline friends. It's, it's really important to understand body language. And you have to understand not all puppies are gonna immediately enjoy being picked up and they're gonna tell you, they might growl, they might bark, they might cry. And we wanna respect that. And we really wanna understand each puppy for who they are and then help them to learn to enjoy the things that they might not be familiar with. So it's very easy to teach most puppies to enjoy that body handling. So for example, if you're puppy cries every time you pick him up or if he gives you a little growl or a little snarl, then you can uh, pick the puppy up and give the puppy a treat and then put the puppy back down. And that's saying, hey, it wasn't so bad. When I pick you up, you get a yummy treat. And there's lots of reasons that a puppy might not enjoy being held. So you want to think about that. He could be in pain. Uh, it could be scary for him if he's never had a lot of human contact before he came to you. Uh, and it's also new and it's unfamiliar. The only exception that I make as far as not respecting a puppy's ask is if it's for safety. So if a puppy is chewing on a wire or running out the door or something that, you know, you want to try to prevent, pick the puppy up and put it somewhere else. Never punish a puppy for growling at you. Uh, never punish an adult dog for growling at you either. It's um, back to that. You don't want to punish that growl because that growl is your puppy communicating to you. Hey, I don't like this. It's really no different than a person saying, um, hey, please back off or please don't touch me or hey, I don't like that. But they don't have words, so they have to use their little growls. Uh, let's see. So here's a video on body handling. This is uh, Kinsey, one of my foster puppies. I wanna say like 
four months ago, maybe, maybe five months ago. I can't keep track of time anymore. But she had a lot of trouble putting on the leash and collar. So what I would do with her is I would click the leash, give her a treat, click the leash on, give her a treat. And she eventually got really comfortable with it. She was not comfortable with putting on her harness and mm -hmm. that took significantly longer. We just never got there, but she did become more comfortable over time with the leash and collar. So I'll show you that quick video. Oops. Um, so that's basically what I do. And that little like one minute was the session and I don't want to push her too far. And sometimes I'll pull on the collar a little bit just to get them used to the pressure and make them, you know, understand, hey, it's not a bad thing that this collar's on your neck. It's really not that scary. And, and when you do it and you put it on and you feel that tug or you feel somebody grabbing the leash and it's not a big deal, you know, we're just going to keep on moving along with life. Um, so that is body handling and whoop, uh, she will talk about play with puppies. Uh, that I'm laughing because those are two foster puppies I had a couple months ago. Uh, the thing about having two puppies, it can be a little bit um, difficult if one is more dominant than the other or one is more aggressive. And usually what I do is just observe them in the beginning when I first bring them home, because you can usually tell fairly early on if they're going to be, uh, if one is more aggressive than the other. That's pretty much, and then I just watch how they play. Uh, and obviously you have to step in, I, or I do step in when it gets a little bit too rough, uh, if they're biting a little bit too hard and one is trying to move away, one is trying to walk away and do something different. Um, it's trying to indicate that it wants to, it wants to be left alone. And if that doesn't work, I'll usually step in. Um, and, you know, they really are really quite wonderful together. And I find having two of them together is much better just because they learn to play with one another. And it's just absolutely one of those things that um, is really quite a joy when I'm fostering puppies. Uh, and, you know, I have had just a couple cases in, you know, over the years in so many puppies that I've had where they have gotten a little bit too aggressive and it's really so rare, but you know, in one case we, um, we put the one foster I kept and, and we put a, another foster, I had three at the time. So there was like one odd man out who was getting more aggressive. So, you know, but that is so rare. Usually you can, you can, watch them and uh, just monitor what they're doing and intervene with toys. I always make sure that I have, it's funny, just one long piece of either fabric or uh, rope. 
and they love tug of war. So those are the kind of things I try to make sure they have things that allow them to play together. And it really kind of exhausts them, number one. And it gets them used to um, just playing together. So uh, that's about it. Uh, do you want to talk about these videos? We can play through them. Or would you want me to do that? It's up Go to ahead. you. I, I don't know these videos. Oh, OK. <laughs> Uh, so here's just a couple of examples of puppies playing. So the top two, the first one is a litter of six that I actually had. And we'll watch them and then we'll talk about kind of what they do in their play. So you can kind of see here that, well, little black and white one is spending a little too much time on top, but they did take turns. Uh, these two you're gonna see are gonna kind of rotate on each other. Yep, they take turns being on top. They take turns kind of biting each other's legs. And then when one puppy says, okay, that's enough, they're gonna slow it down themselves. And then they just kind of romp around a little bit. It's quite fun to watch. When they're that little, usually they all get along pretty well. Um, the next one over here, these are Jenny's puppies that she had recently. Uh, they played really nice together. Uh, they're super cute. Same thing, they're kind of taking turns, nipping each other's legs, getting on top of each other. Nobody sticks around for too long. Um, <laughs> then obviously little one falls off the sofa and everybody's like, whoa, what just happened? So they kind of slowed it down themselves and realized their little one on the floor did a little shake off and she said, whew, that was tough. And then they all kind of just chilled out. Well, except the little one on the couch didn't fall off. So he obviously still wants to play. Um, <laughs> Kid girl. But these are just two happy puppies that are getting along pretty well. The, the one at the bottom got adopted next door. I see her every day. Oh, really? Yeah. Curly, come here. Stop barking. <laughs> Um, so they played really nicely together. Now the bottom two are bigger puppies. These are actually in Carolyn's puppy socialization class. So you're going to see that they're going to play a little bit more rough with each other. Uh, if you do have older siblings, this is probably more like what your play is going to look like, but I don't think older siblings go to puppy foster too often. I think it's usually the little ones that there's multiples of, but um, still, it's always good to know good play styles. Um, so you can see the black puppy is kind of looking away and is kind of a little, you're a little bit too much for me, beagly friend. I'm not really sure about what you're doing here. He kind of gave the beagle some signals that said, eh, I'm not really sure what's going on. Um, but the beagle, uh, the video ended. So I don't really know if he took the hint, but it looked like he kept looking away at the puppy playing with the kitty. So hopefully he learned to calm down. And if he didn't, Carolyn or one of the other people in the puppy class would have stepped in to stop him because the black puppy's asking nicely please don't do that. And then we don't want things to escalate. Now this one, these are bigger puppies. So they are wild. Um, okay, okay. So you can see Steph stepped in because the yellow lab puppy was not letting the black puppy up and the black puppy keeps trying to move away. So things like that are just things that you should look out for to kind of um, learn when to separate your puppies and when to ask them to settle down and not play so rough. Overall, these guys are doing pretty well though. Very nice. And then they all kind of calmed the situation down on their own. So they, 
all just kind of all right cool yes uh so that is puppy play okay puppy to human play um, Sue, I don't remember. Were you doing this one or was I? Doing yeah, that's fine. Um, I, you know, it's rare for me just to have one puppy. Uh, usually I have two, but even when I have two, I always make sure to have, <clears throat> excuse me, time when I'm just playing with one of them. So they get used to having that human touch, particularly um, like these guys are new. There's one, even at six weeks, who's a really strong biter. So I'm working with her and giving her toys and she's learning and it's so funny. And when she really starts to bite hard, I pick her up and then put her back down. She's doing amazing, even after like four days. So it's just a matter of making sure that they're not doing some behavior that is mostly it's biting um, or pulling on clothing. So I always make sure there's all different things, different textured toys too. So this one, uh, that's one of my favorite things to have is just a long piece of rope that's not looped or anything, of course. And they love chewing on that. They love pulling on that. And then uh, if they put something down, putting something else in their mouth so they learn how to play with the human. And then together, mostly the, the problems that I see um, is in terms of eating. Uh, you know, when they're playing, that's fine. But when I put food down, I always make sure there's two different dishes and that I'm there. Uh, and they're used to my hand being there, putting the dish down, put, picking it back up. They're used to my hand with treats. So they get very, very, um, um, they just get very calm when they are playing with a, a human. And that's what we really want. I also have grandchildren that are older. So that, that helps tremendously. They're always over when I have the puppies so that they get used to playing with puppies and playing with kids. And however, I've had small children over on occasion. I always make them make sure that they sit on the floor to play with the puppy because they're so wiggly. Um, so um, that's about it. It's just really mostly the nipping is the thing that's the hardest thing to, to work with, but it just takes consistency and trading toys and just getting them used to, you know, me handling them. So that's it, Linz. Okay. Uh, yeah. So just sometimes with the nipping, um, if it's too much, sometimes if I have like the last one I had dot was like a super nipper, I would actually, you know, calm the situation down. If she got too nippy, we would go on a walk or I would tell her it's time to settle on her own with an enrichment toy or something like a, a scatter feeder or a Kong with some treats in it. So if it gets too exciting for the puppies with the humans, sometimes I have to tell them it's time to take a break and, and humans aren't gonna play like that. It's not, um, it's not appropriate. So I'm gonna give you something else to do that's a little bit more relaxing. Um, that's one of my, not my favorite things to do. Cause I do enjoy, I do enjoy playing with the puppies too, but I also like teaching them a lot of times that it's not time to play 24 hours a day. We do have to relax. <laughs> um, Can I just add that if one is doing, usually the other one follows it sometimes. <laughs> and it's like two hanging off two legs. So it's like <laughs> both of them want to do it, but one initiates and the other one thinks that's what it's supposed to do. So <laughs> they learn all of each other the wrong things too. So puppies are very good at Simon Says. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm sorry, Sue, I kind of lost track of my list, but did you want to talk about one puppy versus two? Yeah, or did sure, you want me to sure. do that? Um, <laughs> I, you know, on occasion, I've had two puppies uh, uh, and then one of them has, has had to, has gotten ill. Uh, I've had that with Parvo. So then I end up with one puppy. And uh, really what I was saying earlier about making sure that they have enough play time with me. I do try with my dogs. I have one of my guys uh, really doesn't mind the puppies. So just getting them used to what happens when they do something like bite the the other pup you know the my the resident dog's ears they learn very quickly and i always you know let them play with one of the dogs that just growls so they start to learn the cues for what they're doing wrong 
um, because when there's two puppies, they're easily, you know, they learn a lot about all of that interaction with another dog. They learn, you know, boundaries. Um, so when there's one puppy, it takes a little bit more um, planning for me because they have to have time where you're playing with them, where a human is playing with them, or my grandchildren are. And then I also try to give them some time with one of my dogs that's really good with them. Um, uh, especially tr learning really boundaries. <laughs> uh, and then when the, you have the two puppies, it's really, in my opinion, I find it much easier because they, uh, they love to sleep together, snuggle together. Uh, most of the time they just love to play together. You know, um, it's good to see them, they'll swap toys. Uh, they do mimic other things, you know, something that the other one does. And you, you know, sometimes you have one that is really quick in learning something and the other one picks it up quickly too. Uh, so, you know, the two puppies I find to be, uh, it can be a little bit taxing <laughs> because of just trying to handle their food time, their play time, their outside time. But it, I do find that they, uh, they really do settle in together and they learn a lot during that period. So, I mean, one puppy is great. It's a little less work, uh, a little bit more planning. And when there's two puppies, obviously supervision is important, but uh, you know, it becomes uh, a matter of them learning from each other, really. Sue, so, so, do you have a cat? I do not. Interesting, because I was just thinking, because I forgot that I put or a cat in parentheses, and I, I do always find the uh, interactions with my resident cats and the puppies pretty interesting. And I feel like most puppies, um, if I have a single puppy, are more interested in playing with the cat because they're of a similar size. <laughs> but if I've had two puppies, they tend to ignore the cats more often. So it's, I find with my cats, it's always a matter of knowing the cat and whether or not the cat's gonna react well to it, which I have one that does and one that doesn't. Um, so just interesting uh, to think about cats too, which most people don't because if you have cats, they're usually just kind of like an accessory in the house. <laughs> <laughs> um, were you done? I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, no, that's fine. I mean, the other thing that's most important with two puppies is the issue of um, food aggression. And that's another one of those uh, issues that I, you know, I'm supervising early on. And usually it shows up right away. And, um, but most of the puppies do well. I always feed them with two separate bowls just to, you know, enable them to have their own little space. Now, it, you know, of course, as soon as you put two balls down, when one starts eating, they both want to be in that bowl, which is fine, but they know that they have their own space. And I do watch for that because it's one of those behaviors I like to try to uh, steer them away from with positive reinforcement before that becomes a thing, uh, especially because that could get a lot worse when they get larger. So yeah, that's it, Linz. Awesome. So, uh, separation training, this is something that with my dear Crowley, I, I have a lot of experience with. I do think that it's important to teach the puppies uh, to feel confident and comfortable when they're alone and that it's okay to rest uh, on a crate or on a, on a bed or in a crate. Um, I have a video on here as well, so I'll show you kind of what I do with the puppies. But to teach a place cue or to teach go to your crate, it should all be fun. Uh, I try never to pick up the puppy and force the puppy into the crate if they don't want to go in. I try to have them go in on their own and then give them a treat rather than throw the treat in, have them go in and close the door really quick behind them. I don't want to trick the puppies. I want them to want to go in to get the reward. Uh, and again, I think there's a video on here next, which I can show you um, kind of how I do that. Uh, I do offer chew toys and snuffle mats and stuffed Kongs when they are in their separate space so they can learn to enjoy a yummy treat or a fun activity by themselves. That helps the puppies, again, learn to feel comfortable and confident off to the side and not need to be with myself or with my, my dog or snuggling on the couch. It helps when you want to go to work and puppy is comfortable being home alone. Uh, it also helps that set them up for the transition to their new home and things along those lines. There's a lot of really awesome puppy enrichment 
DIY things. And uh, in the ebook that uh, I'm going to ask Lisa if she can post it to the volunteer page. Sorry, Curly's going to bark in a second. No bark. Good boy. Um, uh, there's lots of DIY resources and links that you guys will get and you'll be able to see if you're interested in any of those. And uh, a lot of times, especially if you have a single puppy, they can have trouble being alone. And that's not unusual. Most puppies come in a multiple litter family. And this is the first time away from mom and their siblings in a new place, new smells, new pretty much everything. So you really want to help them enjoy being alone and enjoy taking in these new things and not relying on somebody else to be their source of comfort. Uh, this cute little picture over here in the corner is one of Carolyn's recent litters with her two little chihuahuas playing in a, I think it's a paper towel roll. Uh, not all puppies are gonna be that tiny that they can run through a paper towel roll, but these guys were particularly small. So, but there's a, they can also use the paper towel roll to play with, or you can stuff kibble inside of it, or you can put wet food inside of it and freeze it. Or I think Sin, you, or Sue, you use um, boiled sweet potato for the puppies a lot. I do, I do. You can use <clears throat> that and put that inside of a paper towel roll and make them work for it a little bit. Fun stuff like that. Um, so if you do have a puppy that has a lot of trouble being alone, there are some really great activities that you can do to help them with that. And uh, even just starting small and saying, let's go in the crate and I'll sit next to the crate with the door closed and you can enjoy this great toy and you're in your space and I'm in my space, but I'm still here and it's okay. And that helps them a lot. Uh, and then you can slowly start to move away and slowly they're gonna be like, all right, you're on the couch now and I'm in my crate with my toy and this is great, this is fine then you can slowly go to another room and kind of work from there. It sounds like a long process, but it's the most kind way to do it rather than shoving them in there and saying, you're not happy, but you can scream and cry until you fall asleep kind of doesn't help them learn to be okay with it. It kind of makes them feel as though they have no other choice. Uh, let's see my video here. So I have two videos. I have Dot, who had a lot of separation issues. I taught Dot that every morning breakfast was in her pen and she would run to her pen on her own. And then I also did some crate training with Dot, which I'll kind of talk about as the video goes. Um, so this is Dot learning to go in the crate yes. and then she gets a treat. And I don't close the door every time. I close the door a little bit and then I open yes, the door. Sometimes I leave the door open, but that teaches her sometimes the door might close, but it's okay, it's not a problem. Um, she, this particular puppy, yes, if I walked girl. out the front door, she would scream and cry and carry on like somebody was trying to hurt her. Um, and then I would let her come out and then I would ask her to go back in again to get some more treats. Great. And she yeah. loved it. She would go in and she would wait. And then I would close the door sometimes, sometimes not. Sometimes I did yes. one lock, sometimes I did two locks. It really just was a matter of getting her used to all the mechanisms of closing the door and opening the door and being locked in a crate. Um, particularly for Dot, she never really learned to enjoy it. Yes, um, but she learned to be alone in other ways. The crate itself was really hard for her, but she learned to be alone in the pen and be comfortable with that, which um, some puppies don't, you know, we, the crate training is great, but uh, if the puppy really struggles with it, you, you want to do everything you can to keep them in a safe, manageable place. That's not going to be a place that they can hurt themselves in. Uh, and she would have, if I left her alone in the crate, she would have absolutely hurt herself. But here's her running every morning to her, oops, didn't play, uh, running to her Come on, breakfast. pen for Ready breakfast. Dot? Come on, let's go. Come on. Come on, let's go. Go, Dot, go. 
Yay! Good girl. Go get it. And I would close the little pen door and she would play with her toy and I would walk away and she would spend five or 10 minutes by herself in her pen. And she would sit and wait for me to come and let her out, which was pretty cool. Uh, and that was one of the best ways that I helped her with being alone. Um, what's next, Sue? Socialization and positive experiences. Would you like to do that? Yeah, that's fine. Um, one other thing I wanted to say about the, um, the separation anxiety, I use blankets a lot, like on the pen. Oh, yes. Me when too. I yes. first get there, I always put a blanket over their crate so they know. And it's funny, even though they have the pen and they have the opportunity to go in the crate or not, uh, they tend to go in that crate. It's blanketed and it's like their little cave. And what I do with the pen, the outside pen, uh, I have the blankets on there at times. And there's a lot of noise here with my other dogs or, I, you know, I'm busy or I'm on the computer or whatever on a Zoom call. And they get used to hearing all that. And sometimes I put the blankets on and take them off. They really get very used to the noise that's around. So they get comfortable in there. And sometimes I just take all the blankets off of the outside pen and they just watch everything that's going on. But in the beginning, it's very, very helpful for me to use that piece where they learn to understand what's going on in the house and to settle themselves in there. Um, so this is what I was talking about earlier, positive experiences for me, the, the thing that's always fun to, is to take them outside because many times I think it's the first time they've been outside in the grass. It's always amazing. These two little guys, uh, the one is still a little bit sick. She's, they're both getting over parvo. But the uh, other one, she, she runs around in, in the crate. When I took her out to the yard, she was hopping like a bunny. So it is always funny to watch them when it's a new texture, you know, the grass or if the grass is wet, you know, this morning it, the grass was wet. It's interesting to watch them. Uh, you know, as far as leash walking, because I have a fenced in yard, that's not something that I do often with the puppies. You know, I will get them introduced to a, um, to a collar, which I don't leave on them when they're in there, but I don't do leash walking per se. Um, and the other thing is noises. So I work with, you know, them, I have the vacuum cleaner on, there's, uh, I have, we have a fish tank here. It gets a little bit noisy sometimes when it's being cleaned out or the, the filter goes on and off. So they're getting used to things that they don't really have to react to them. Um, uh, and as far as they love the snuffle mats, I use them all the time with the puppies and I just put dry kibble in there and they absolutely love them. The other thing I use, which is funny uh, is taking pieces of parchment paper, rolling it up. It makes so much noise for them and they can chew it and not, and it's, and bat it around, you know, so that's another thing that I use where they absolutely love that. And of course the um, paper towel or toilet, the cardboard, that's another thing that I'll put something in there and they'll play with that. Um, and, you know, most of the time, sorry, sorry guys, Cassidy, Cassidy. Um, most of the time, you know, the, they are a little bit taken aback by the vacuum. So I just work with that. You know, I turn it off, put it back on. And most of the time they get very used to obviously um, Cassidy's big bark. Uh, so that's <laughs> something that I try to do all different things with them. Uh, and, um, you know, the car, the car is one thing. When, when I'm going on errands, I'll put them in their crate in the car. So they're used to that. It's not, it, it's not always a bad thing. Um, and if they don't want to do something, I don't force them ever, you know, if they don't want to, to be around my dogs or whatever, it's just learning to just work with them where they are and all the different things that I can get them to experience, whether it's the toys, the textures outside, inside, it, it all helps. Definitely. Um, that's about it. Uh, I think one other thing worth mentioning, which I don't think that we had on here was, um, if they're not fully vaccinated, they should not be going on walks around the neighborhood uh, because you just don't know what other dogs are leaving behind. And because we get them out of the kennel because they're not fully vaccinated, we don't wanna put them in another environment where they can pick something up. So uh, we do, uh, I, Tiffany and Amelia can confirm that they shouldn't be anywhere, but with your resident pets and in your yard. 
Uh, I have on occasion had older single foster puppies that have been vaccinated and I will take them on walks and do some leash stuff with them, but otherwise they shouldn't be out and about. Um, and the next video is actually a video of Dot learning to be okay with the vacuum. And it's just a cute little video on kind of how I introduce it with some treats and some fun to make her be like, oh, you know, this loud noisy thing makes a lot of treats appear. So we can just watch that really quickly. So you can see just little noises, lots of treats. Don't want to scare her. My, I have no interest in startling her with the noises or anything along those lines, but I'll move the vacuum around while it's quiet. I'll move the vacuum around while it's on. It just teaches her that weird, noisy things are not that bad. Good things happen. And then of course, my Crowley's like, why are we doing this? I don't understand. <laughs> but you can see Dot's curious little face and she's like, whoa, that made noise. And then she got the treats. Um, and also just real quick, if you see in the background, I have my baby pool with tennis balls in it. That's a great enrichment activities for the puppies. They love it. Oh, she got a little scared when I moved it. So just threw her some treats and I said, hey, that wasn't so bad. Here's some fun stuff. Um, I did have one puppy that I didn't do the vacuum training with and I wasn't thinking and I turned on the vacuum and the poor little thing ran so fast to my glass sliding door that she ran into it and that was the end of the vacuum for her. Um, so you just do have to be careful kind of with things like that. You don't, you don't want to put them in experiences that are going to startle them <laughs> and ruin experiences for life. So I was able to slowly introduce the vacuum back to her, but it just takes longer when you mess it up before. <laughs> um, we don't need to watch the whole thing because it's pretty self-explanatory. But by the end, I was vacuuming and Dot had no problem with it. She was just looking for food on the ground. She was like, this is great. Noises mean food all over the floor. I don't know what she's doing here, but she was having fun, so. <laughs> Okay. Uh, sniffing. Is that me, Sue, or you? I, I can do that one, uh, Linz. Uh, I guess this the thing that's about sniffing that is amazing is the fact that that is something that really, uh, uh, A, takes their attention. It makes them, uh, it actually exhausts them. It's so funny. When I first put the guys, the puppies out in the yard, there's so many things out there. Um, and I should put a plug in here, especially in the summer. I am really cautious and really careful with the puppies. I'm always supervising them. Some of them, like these guys are very tiny. Um, I watch because they, there's hawks. I have a lot of hawks around here and a lot of large birds. Uh, so that's one thing, just the safety issue with um, when they're outside sniffing around in the yard, the other pieces, there are a lot of plants that are poisonous. Uh, to dogs. And uh, so, um, you know, I don't have any of those around. Um, and there's plenty of plate, you know, you can just go on the internet and do a search for plants that are poisonous, outside plants, it's more uh, a, a big issue for me in the summer. So that's just I'll put that out there. Uh, and then just, you know, keeping them, uh, you know, um, the snuffle mat, for, I have found to be unbelievable, because they get used to doing things together. And you know, trying to find things that are in there, I use different things in the snuffle mat that absolutely they love. And uh, you know, I talked about the other things as well. When you're uh, different smells, peanut butter, sweet potatoes, um, things that I can put in their enrichment toys that they get used to just sniffing. And unbelievably, once they come in from having a, a, you know 20 minutes outside doing all their running around and sniffing everything, they go right to sleep. So it really is very calming and and it gives you a chance to uh let them you know be outside so that's that's all and what do dogs do best sue 
they sniff, right? Yeah, yeah, right, right. Because right. they're not everything. It's everything. like that's just that's just what dogs are. So why not give them an opportunity to do it more often, right? Yeah, they love it. Um. Okay. So building resiliency. Um, if you don't mind, Sue, I could talk about this because these are more, more videos that I just kind of plopped in here of my lovely fosters. Um, I am big on confidence building and helping these puppies really realize that, you know, a lot of things in life that can be scary don't have to be scary. Uh, you really want to not force a puppy ever to approach something that is concerning to them. So for example, with the vacuum, I would never have picked Dot up and held her in front of the vacuum to say, hey, look, it's not scary. I really want them to figure it out on their own. Um, I want them to learn that these scary things mean good things actually happen. And a way to do that is to teach your puppy tricks. These eight week old puppies can learn to sit they can learn to touch target. They can learn to lay down. They can really do anything that you put the time in with them to do. They're brilliant. You know, if they can learn to go potty outside, they can learn to do some basic tricks and activities. Um, same thing with the new, uh, new experiences that Sue went over in one of the previous slides. But if they do have a scary experience, you can help them recover from something scary by being joyful and happy and offering them lots of really yummy treats or just something that they really enjoy doing. So for example, if you teach a dog to roll over and it really enjoys doing that and something scary happens, you can walk five feet away and say, let's play a game, let's roll over, let's do tricks then all of a sudden that scary thing kind of becomes a moment of the past and they're not gonna dwell on it. Uh, if you do put something new in the room and they are afraid of it, just let them explore it on their own. And if they don't wanna go near it and they're too afraid of it, you know, pick it up and take it out and try it again another time. We don't need to force these little guys to do anything that they are unsure about because you know, the best thing to do is to build resiliency by letting them figure it out on their own. Um, and we can watch these little videos here. This is Peaches, the little black lab looking pup. And she was petrified of this cat toy. And I just let her figure it out. So sorry about the music, but this is her playing with the cat toy. <laughs> Obviously, I didn't let her keep that cat toy because it had a long string on it and I didn't want her to eat it. But I also wanted her to realize that, you know, if she wanted to play with it, it was not that scary. Uh, and I, you know, didn't pick her up. I didn't hold the toy in front of her. I didn't say, hey, look, it's okay. It's not scary. I let her kind of do it on her own. Uh, these, again, in the bottom are Carolyn's little Chihuahua puppies playing in the tube super cute little video of them just exploring a new object um and again you're not going to have most puppies able to fit through a paper towel tube this is this is carolyn's uh department here but they had fun uh and they you know learned hey this weird paper towel tube is quite a cool thing to play with and you can see carolyn has kibble all over the floor so she has these new fun toys. And that was her, you know, signature laugh at the end as well. Um, so this one here, I don't quite remember. Dot is learning to tip over a bottle and there's rocks in the bottle, which is pretty cool because it kind of helps Dot realize that thing makes noise, but it's okay. I get a treat and Dot actually gets to control the noises and decide whether or not she wants to knock over the bottle and hear the loud noise which is a great resilience activity and confidence building because Dot created the noise and Dot gets a treat for creating the noise, which is really fun to watch. Uh, and then of course, Curly bored out of his mind in the corner because I'm not paying attention to him.
my favorite thing is watching these little guys figure out what I'm looking for. Uh, it's kind of one of the reasons I foster puppies personally, because I love teaching them new things. It's my favorite <laughs> thing to do. Um, we don't need to watch the whole three minute video, but she got really, really yeah. impatient because she wanted to do it. And then I think I confused her. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, she did that for about 10 minutes that day, if I remember correctly. And this is just Kinsey again, who's the little one who was afraid of the collar. I taught her a touch target. So she learned to touch my hand. Uh, and Kinsey here is only like eight weeks old, I believe at this time, maybe not even if I remember correctly. And she picked up on everything so quickly. It's just fascinating to watch them. At least for me, I don't know. I might just be a, a dog training nerd, but I love it. I, I could do it all day long if I, if I was able. Um, but stuff like this and, and teaching them tricks really teaches them confidence. Hey, I'm doing it right. I'm doing what you want. This is fun, you know, and it, it builds a foundation for training later on in life with kind of the bigger things that are more important, like, you know, not pulling on the leash and, um, you know, laying down in the house and things like that. Okay. Body language. Did you want me to do this, Sue, or I forget? I can do it. It's up to you. No, Fine. go ahead. There's another video of Dot here okay. um, that I can talk about, but you can talk about the body language and then I can do the video. Okay, awesome. Um, I think, you know, especially for new fosters, this becomes like such a key piece for, uh, you know, I know it was for me when you're first learning what these puppies, some of them being so young at six weeks, it's amazing how much these exact body language it, you know, issues and postures really do tell you a lot about the puppy um, and just trying to work with them. And the most important thing, you know, when they feel threatened, certainly uh, sometimes when they're in their pen and Cassidy goes by, you can just see them backing up. You know, it's really awesome for you. It's the only way I have to tell how they're progressing. Um, you know, are they threatened, which is a pretty obvious one, anxious, the little tail gets tucked and they, you know, they hunker down a little bit. And it's amazing as you watch and work with them with the, with the different postures that they'll take and they change, you know, to that the ta tail is wagging. Like I have one little puppy now, uh, two of them are here in Parvo recovery, but the one has been feeling really sick. And this morning she wagged her little tail. Like these are the little things that I'm thinking, okay, she's feeling a little bit better. Um, uh, you know, and the most important thing for me is if they feel really threatened or if they're really anxious, which I've had puppies that do not want you to, to approach them, mm -hmm. or if you put your hand down, they run. So I depend so much on this particular issue of reading their body language. And then a lot of times I'll just sit and work with them with treats when it's, uh, when they're anxious to have somebody come to them, or if they're anxious when they see a hand go down. I do a lot, a lot of the training that I do with the puppies depends on these particular body postures and what you can learn from them. And then you do see the transition. So it's almost like you see them learning as you go. Um, so it's, it's really important and they tell you an awful lot without being able to speak. <laughs> so that's it, Linz. Yeah, so here's just a cute little video of Dot um, in a little bit of a fearful state here in a new place. Now, remember, this is right outside my front door, but Dot was an older puppy who uh, was fully vaccinated. So I did take her outside and she's not leashed, but that's because she ran out the door to follow me and she didn't know where she ended up. So I just let her kind of explore. And then I called her back inside, but you can see her tail is down. Her ears are back. She's doing kind of like a low crouching walk and it's clear. It's very obvious. And she's sniffing as well, which sniffing can kind of be, um, you know, saying, I'm going to sniff over here. I mean, no harm. Uh, and, you know, I brought her out there another time and then another time and her body language 
slowly she was like okay this place isn't so bad it's scary and there's new smells out here but it's not that bad and like you said being able to read that body language really helps us to not put them in situations that are going to be overly stressful for them uh, and this is just a cute little chart uh, with a bunch of little body language things on them. And that'll also, I believe, be in that the little ebook that Lisa has that we can get sent out to people if you want it as a reference. But her name is Lily Chin. She actually has a whole book as well on dog body language, which I recommend for anybody who does anything with dogs. Um, and Sue, since you're our medical foster professional, would you like to do this one? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> um, I know this number by heart, extension 228. Um, Tiffany, I've talked to you a million times on the phone. I mean, this is, of course, the number one thing you have. Safety for the puppies is uh, is, is an obvious uh, major concern. And then secondly, it's medical. Uh, and what I find is when, as soon as the puppies come in, they're usually between six to eight weeks. I've had them nine weeks old as well. But the you know, kennel cough is pretty obvious because either they have some uh, discharge from their nose, or it almost sounds like initially if uh, when they start with the kennel cough as if they're choking on something. So uh, just paying attention to any of the signs and calling the, the health department if you have any questions. We have such a great health department. That is the truth. Um, they just are amazing in just being able to take a look at the, the puppy and see if there's anything going on. Uh, parasites and worms, I, <laughs> I think I could probably do a whole presentation on them, unfortunately. But what, uh, what you're looking for is obvious uh, diarrhea, loose stools, um, the obvious uh, visual cue, which is you can see the worms or the parasite in the, in the uh, stool. And that just requires a call to, you know, to ISO and then to have, uh, bring a stool sample over and whatever they have, you know, whatever parasites are there, there's medication that I get for them. Um, sometimes they're getting, you know, something for the parasites and something for the kennel cough. It becomes like a little, <laughs> we have our little medical corner. Um, parvo, uh, you know, the most important thing that I see, the clear indicator for me is a lack of appetite. They don't want to eat. They don't want to touch any food, which is very unusual for a puppy. They're always smelling and trying to eat everything. Uh, and just absolute lethargy. They just want to lay down. They, um, right now I have one that's still a little lethargic um, and the other one is a little bit too active for her. So you just see, you know, yesterday I had her uh, called, uh, Tiffany was kind to get me in there at the end of the day, she got some fluids. So it's just really, Parvo's a really big concern. And so I call right away if they do not want to eat, they do not want to drink, and they have absolutely no interest in anything in their surroundings, which is so unusual for a puppy. Um, and then if there's anything, I'm always very conscious of, you know, there's obviously a lot of people foods, chocolate, uh, chewing gum, uh, you know, I always have to caution and do a, a you know, uh, look around when the kids are here, when my grandkids are here, you know, because sugarless gum, I'm just very careful of all those things that can be, and even foods, you know, raisins and chocolate and um, grapes, et cetera. So, and there is a poison control center. I haven't used it for any of my puppies. I have used it for a resident dog at one point, but, uh, that's another good number to have handy always. Um, and the, you know, the emergency line, uh, I've used maybe three times in all these years. So that's just for a real, real, um, you know, after the hours when medical isn't there or when you're really concerned about something with the puppy. Um, so that's it. Puppies are amazing. They'll let you know when something's bothering them, that's for sure. So that's it. I'm sure maybe Amelia and Tip might have something else. Um, yeah, I think my number one thing is always, if I don't know, call, just call, <laughs> call yes. and ask. Uh, you don't want to risk anything and, and wait till, you know, it's too long. Uh, uh, as far as surgery goes, um, puppies, young puppies can have a small meal in the morning. They digest pretty quickly. I usually always tell the person who takes my puppy to the back that they did have something little to eat just because 
you know, it's good for them to have that information. Um, but young puppies, you know, they need that nutrition. So there's no point in starving them from eight o'clock until the time of their surgery, because if they eat, they usually poop within 20 minutes and it's through their body. Um, surgery drop-off is nine to 9.30. And I personally like to pick my puppies up after their surgery so they can rec recover in a place that they're familiar with rather in the kennels. And then when you do that, you would drop them off the following morning or if they're on hold for an event, um, you would coordinate with uh, Tiffany or Amelia as far as when that drop off would be. Uh, surgery pickup is from four to five in the evening and all puppies do recover from their surgery a little bit differently. Most of them, at least in my experience, bounce back pretty quickly. I think in all my foster puppies, I only had one puppy with the aside of uh, my one who had his little arm amputated, he was a tough recovery, but I only had one puppy that um, did not respond too well to the anesthesia and he slept for a good 12 hours and maybe vomited a couple times afterwards, but, and then he woke up the next morning and ready to go again. Um, but most of the time they respond to it pretty well and, and recover pretty quickly. So I think primarily you just want to not a lot of rough play. You want to keep them calm, especially if you have multiples uh, and then make sure they're not licking or chewing at their incision. I Sue, I don't know if you've had, I don't think I've ever had any puppy that aggravated or bothered their incisions in that first night. And I don't think I've ever needed to put a cone on them. Uh, have no, you? I have not. I have yeah, no, me either. I think, I think the puppies handle it much better than the <laughs> older dogs. Yeah. Um, and that's pretty much it for surgery. They, you know, they take care of everything at the center and, you know, you go from there. Uh, and then of course, if you have medical questions, as far as surgery goes, you can <laughs> always call. Um, Sue, you're good at gifts. You want to do uh, gift yeah, ideas and say goodbye? This is like one of my favorite things because I, it gives you an opportunity. I always write a note. Um, I'll put my email for, you know, if they have any questions, uh, the adopters, but I put in there all the little quirks and all the little things that I've seen, little behaviors, little tricks that they do. Um, the last puppies before these uh, were amazing. They would sit for treats. They would sit for their meals, even though they were eight weeks old. So I put that in their little note and I've gotten follow-up that this little one even sat to have her leash put on <laughs> without being told. So it is amazing. Like it helps the uh, adopter to get to know a little quirks about their personality. Uh, I always have blankets that they use when they're here. And so each of them will get a blanket because it has all the familiar smells of the other puppy, of themselves, of their toys. And um, this is just on my counter, but the, this toy, it's a little, it has little nibbly knobs on it, like almost like a baby's teething toy. It's one of my favorite. I always put these in the gift bag because they absolutely love those. Um, everybody gets one of those. Uh, and that's about it. And I always include food. So I just figure, you know, for the transition that they have, uh, I do tend to give mine sweet potatoes mixed in with their dry kibble, but I always make sure that there's a, uh, um, you know, a bag of um, the dry kibble that they've been eating and anything else that's happened, you know, that may be of interest for them that they may, you know, that they may like or not like. Uh, and it's always hard. Uh, giving the gift bag and giving the puppy away, right? Um, so, and actually, I, you know, I often get follow up th that they still have their toys. You know, that's the funny thing, um, the toys that they got in their bag. So, I only usually put like a chew toy and one other thing that they play with all the time. Um, I just think it's really important. So, that's all I have for gifts. Yeah, I, I, I've gotten pictures of puppies on a piece of fleece that I gave them when they're a year old. And it's, it's nice to see because um, it's nice to see that it, it actually, it does help and they're comfortable in their new home and, and things like that. Uh, and I think that that's the end. There's a bunch of other resources here, which the links will be on um, the ebook if, uh, when I send that to Lisa you can post it. Um, Nancy, I think you're unmuted. Um, Sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to get Nellie in. Um, 
So yeah, so uh, that's it. And if anybody has questions about any of that, Tiffany and Amelia are here as well to answer anything that Sue or I don't know the answers to, or that might be specific to the foster department. Or if you have any questions about things that Sue and I specifically talked about, uh, we have about 20 minutes to do that if anybody does. Nobody wrote any questions in the chat. Yeah, I don't see any. <laughs> yeah, feel free. Um, you can write them in the chat if you want to unmute yourself. Uh, just try not to talk over oh, each other if you do. Um, but yeah, yeah I do. Go ahead. I do. Um, my name's Susan. I don't know. Can you guys hear me? Yes, you're all good. Okay. Um, the only question I had, because I've fostered in the past, it's been a long, long time. Um, our backyard, we live in Twin House, and there's a lot of neighbors and a lot of dogs. And whenever I had a foster puppy, the neighborhood dog, it's been, they would like touch noses. And I was concerned now, years later, is that bad if the puppy's unvaccinated? It's definitely always a risk. Um, you know, nose to nose, it could could be something like kennel cough. Um, parvo can even be spread by you know bodily functions. Um, it's, I would say, it's probably more of a risk to the puppy, um, just because if it's an adult dog that it's nose to nosing with, um, it's probably vaccinated. Um, but yeah, just just be careful. Um, obviously, the longer they do it, uh, the more of a chance uh, that anything can spread. It's probably unlikely, I'll be honest. Um, just like humans, a lot of things like that can be spread more so when their immune system is down, if they're stressed, and if they're in a foster home, hopefully they're not stressed. Um, so, I don't think you really did anything wrong. Don't feel bad. Um, you know, they they need to have contact with other animals in order to grow and learn how to live with them. So I don't think it's a bad thing necessarily. Um, I would just be cautious about it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I had a few questions that I wanted to give other people opportunity. <laughs> um, somebody, did, did a chat just pop up? Yeah, yes. there's one in the chat as well from Megan. Um, do you want me to read it out? Yeah, go for it. It says, sorry if I missed this, but do puppies need a nap? Do you recommend they rest in a schedule? Um, I personally don't have like a strict schedule. I don't know if you do, Sue. Uh, um, no, it's funny though, but it's quiet now because they were up and playing. They definitely do get into a routine themselves. It's not that I force that, but just based on the routine that I have, they definitely have times where they're, where they sleep. Yeah. Like these guys are sleeping now. And I find that often with the puppies, they get up, they play, they eat, they go outside and then they sleep. So it's almost like they establish a sort of a routine. They definitely need it. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Same experience that they kind of create their own routine. And then after a couple days, you kind of catch on to that. The only time that I ever, I think I mentioned that I, I personally ask them to rest and take a break is if their play is getting way too rough or they're way too nippy. You kind of learn some puppies that's a sign of them being overly tired, especially if you have one puppy and you are responsible for saying, I don't like that play. It's too much. I will put them in a, in a pen or in a crate with time to rest, but not on a like timed schedule for me. Does that answer make, I think who, who was that Jenny? It was Megan. Megan. I hope that answers your question. <gasps> Megan, you're on mute. Oh, hello. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay, thanks. Yeah, that, that was my question. I was like, I, I kind of always treated puppies like in my mind as a toddler. So that was where <laughs> I was kind of going with like, do they need to get put down for a nap? And kind of like flowing into that, 
the puppy we have right now is really good. Like the first few nights he was terrible at sleeping through the night is actually getting a little bit better, but we've kind of regressed a little bit again. But I was just curious if sleeping better or more regularly during the day would lead to a better night. Like I was just looking for any tips about sleeping through the night kind of a thing. Thanks. Megan, I'll, I'll answer that one. I, I think um, the most important thing is to give them some kind of an active period before they, they get put in. And that my guys always have, in all these years, there's always a routine. It's always around the same time in the evening that they're going to be in their pen. And the, I, I do use the cover over the crate. That really does calm them down, absolutely. And make sure that they get out before um, they do exhaust themselves, even if it's for 20 minutes, 15 or 20 minutes, just running around. Or if you don't have a fenced in yard, if you want to, you know, let them run around, I let them, you know, play or whatever. Uh, it seems to help tremendously. Yeah, totally agree. And I, and I think he's doing exactly what you guys are saying of he's almost setting his own schedule and he's, I really can't complain about him sleeping through the night. I think he's, he's setting himself up for success. Just curious again, if there was a recommendation of any kind of sleep schedule that they should follow. So thank you on that. Yeah, thanks, Megan. They're toddlers without limits. <laughs> <laughs> Julie, did you say you had a question? Yeah, I have a few, but I, I don't need to go in a row or anything. Um, so for the training component for it, do you limit the amount of time you spend doing like a training session at all? Like, do they start to burn out on learning at some point during it? And do you limit it to like one trick at a time when you're doing like a training session? What do you recommend? Oh, there's a lot to unpack in that question, Julie. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, so, I mean, I'm assuming you directed that to me since I said I'm a training nerd. So I think I'll, I'll take, take it upon answering that. Um, so most trainers who do positive reinforcement will recommend um, short sessions, short bursts, not, you don't wanna burn out the puppy because what's gonna happen is if you're doing like the touch video that I did with Kinsey, um, if you do it over and over and over again, and she's like, I'm bored, what you're going to do is you're going to ruin that touch cue. And she's going to be like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do it anymore. So if you keep it fun every time and do it for like three or four minutes, then that's kind of where I'm at. However, I have had puppies that love it so much that I could go on for 10 or 15 minutes. Um, mm -hmm. If I think you've just friended me on Facebook, I've got, if you go back in my videos, I taught puppies to ring a bell and they will ring the bell for 20 minutes and they just, they love it. They have so much fun with it. And if they're going to do it, I'm going to let them. Um, I also split the time with Curly and they'll both take turns ringing the bell and they're like, it's my turn. It's my turn. It's my turn. So it kind of depends on the puppy, but some of the things that are more helpful for, I'll say obedience, and that might be a little more boring, three or four minutes, like the crate training, you don't want to do too much, um, like mm -hmm. teaching them to lay down. You don't want to make your puppy lay down for 10 minutes. They can't, they just don't have the attention span for it. Mm -hmm. um, was there another question on that that I missed? Do you train like multiple tricks at once then, or since it's such short burst, you kind of stick to like one at a time when you're doing it? I stick to one at a time personally. Um, what they say is, you know, take the time to perfect one and then you can add, you know, I'll make it a little bit harder, make them lay for a little bit longer. And then if they, it's kind of like, um, I don't know if you are familiar with like social media learning and stuff like that, but if you're doing marketing, they say master one platform before you move on to the next, because you can't learn Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, you know, all of them at the same time, you can master Facebook and then you can master Instagram, stupid comparison. But, you know, if you're teaching your puppy to sit and lay down and touch all within, you know, five minutes, they're going to be like, I don't know what you want from me. It's confusing. Does that make sense? <laughs> I had a question in terms of um, like, where do you actually set up like the pen and crate area or do you have multiple, like I'm, I'm wondering in terms of like, you know, when you go to bed and you're on the second floor, if your office on the second floor, but then you spend like a lot of the day on the first floor, do you have like multiple um, areas or do you 
do you just leave them um, on the first floor during the night or, you know, how does that work? You know what, Tammy, I have, I, I, I use a pen system. So it's, you know, it all snaps together. It's a, um, um, uh, it has a little gate on it even. So that pen is set up in the same spot in my sunroom on the first floor. So there's a lot of activity here and um, which I, I like to have the puppies get used to. And that's where they stay. So they have their crate is inside the pen in the house. And I just find that to be very, very helpful. If I use, and, and using the blankets around the pen gives them their privacy and you know, vice versa, it, it's so versatile. And so, and it also has the ability, you know, it has the added positive thing for me that they are used to that at night. So even on the first and second night when they're here, that's their little spot. They tend to go into the crate automatically. And I just find that to be, and for my dogs, for resident dogs, I do have four other dogs. I am a crazy dog lady. Um, th when they see that pen come out, they're totally, like it's almost relaxing for them. They know the routine is gonna change and they know it might be noisy over there, but it, they feel comfortable that the puppies aren't gonna be out and about when that pen is there. So that's just my system and it, you know, it helps tremendously, so. I yeah, I'm similar. I have the crate with the pen in my living room, kind of in the central area of the house where I, if I'm walking around, it's, it's there and I can give them their nap time and their downtime. Um, I, if I have a single puppy that does have trouble in the crate alone at night, I have put the crate in my bedroom. It tends to help them with the crate training. It's a little bit less of a blow for when they're alone. Um, uh, it's for me it kind of depends on the puppy if they're comfortable in the crate by themselves and I'll stick them in the crate downstairs and go upstairs and shower or you know go to bed but if it's if the puppy like my last one has trouble being alone I'll make accommodations for it does that help Tammy yeah thank you and and do you and so you have the pee pads in the in the pen area too um okay I wasn't sure if that like Will they learn to, when you take them out, to go outside, even if there's still pee pads there? They absolutely do. Mm -hmm. They're so, they really learn that the pee pads are in one area. I also make sure that that's in a very separate area from where their toys are in the pen. Um, there's a little bed that's outside of the crate. So they have that area and they do use that pee pad. And then, you know, as I said, when I take them out, they do get the potty training very quickly, even though the pee pads are in the pen. I do use Okay. Them. Okay, great. I, I got mine older, so I, I, I missed the puppy stage. <laughs> um, can I just add something? Um, I think my experience with, you know, like when the puppy first arrives, if they have an accident because they almost don't know where to do their business, I kind of use a pee pad to soak the soak the accident up like pee and then put it in the area where I tend to set up the pee pee pad area and when I transition them out sometimes if they don't understand I've had luck when I just take one of the pee pads and then put it on the outside like the patio or the grass area so they relate to it to kind of transition them from inside the house to outside so they're like okay this is a familiar smell it's my smell so maybe I can go here kind of just like the first few days because they basically either can go anywhere or they just don't know where to go. So there tends to be one accident all the time for me. So I just use that up kind of to my advantage, if I can say so. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. I personally, I've never used puppy pads mm -hmm. except for the litter that I had. Um, but I also, my entire first floor is hard floor. And if they have an accident on the floor, it's not a problem. And my sliding door, which I think you may have seen in some of those videos is right there. So the puppies are right next to the door. So for me personally, I just pick them up and put them outside. It's just that easy. Um, but if you, if your house is bigger or you have carpet, definitely, you know, go the puppy pad route. I think at that point it's personal preference what works for you and your system.
And I will put a plug in also for having a piece of linoleum. I just got a really pe uh, cheap piece of linoleum from Home Depot. It's really pliable and movable. It's, it's light. And I put that on in, in the pen area. So if you had hardwood floors, it's so helpful. Even with the tile floors, none of the um, gross things that puppies tend to do get into the grout. So that's another, I'll put a plug in for that. It really makes life much simpler, easier to clean. So Smart. <laughs> I agree with that. I have a question, very specific to this dog. Um, my uh, my foster has a uh, urinary tract infection, sure. and uh, before we got the medication, uh, her behavior was to squat, to attempt to pee, then walk to another spot, squat and strain, walk mm -hmm. to another, and it was constant. Every two minutes, she would squat and strain, squat. She's on the medication now. But that's a learned behavior, the squat and go and squat. And so I'm trying to trying to extinguish that. If she's on my lap, she won't pee. She can't pee. So how, how do I um, extend the period between peeing? Like I'll, I'll take her outside and, and she will pee and I will praise her. And then I take her inside and I'll hold her so that she won't get down to squat again. Any suggestions? <laughs> Is she uh, still on the medication? Yes, yes. Okay. She'll be on it until Monday. Got and um, she's doing better. You know, she's not in pain anymore, thank goodness. Yeah. Um, and Lindsay, you can go over behavior uh, if you want. Uh, as far as like, medication and how she feels goes um she's probably on like amoxicillin or something like yeah. that mm -hmm. um it can she might not feel as bad she might be looking really good but she could still feel like the burn of a uti um i'm sure we've all felt it at one point <laughs> but um it could take a little bit um it could be behavior definitely but uh, it could also just be that she still feels uncomfortable. Yeah. It might not be painful, but it could be uncomfortable. Um, so, I mean, if she keeps doing that and she's ending the medication soon, then I would probably lean more towards, all right, let's work on it. But okay. Lindsay, if you have other thoughts, please add them. The only thing that I was going to say, I was going to say, obviously, check it and make sure it's not a consistent medical issue because you if it's medical it's medical and if it burns it burns but the only yeah. advice as far as potty training goes that i would have is try to wait until she's completely done eliminating before you do the praise and treat mm -hmm. um because a lot of times even without a uti if you say good girl and give a treat as soon as they start going it can become habit of mm -hmm. squat p squat p squat p and not fully eliminating mm -hmm. but I don't really know the connection as far as uh, feeling ill. And so sorry. Uh, there's a man climbing a ladder outside my window. Um, so yeah, I don't really know the connection as far as how long it takes a UTI to heal and things along those lines. Uh, I don't know if, if Sue has anything behaviorally to add for that as well. The only thing, Carrie, I'd like to get my guys used to being outside the pen, of course, and being in the in the house. But um, do you restrict her areas, or does she have free run of the house? I find that's a little bit hard for puppies because they don't quite get the she, association with when they have to uh, pee. So. She's restricted to um, our family room, and there are certain areas where she wants to pee, where uh, we have some newspapers down. Um, but but when she was really bad, those those that first day, um, she would just walk anywhere she could, as if, you know, maybe if I go to another spot, the pain will go away, you know. And and I just find with puppies when they have free run of the whole room, you know, when I take yeah. them, I make sure that they've been out, they've played, and they pee. But it, yours is a little bit particular because right. of the medical issue. 
but also when the puppy is outside of the pen and just running free in the house, I don't think they get the association of where they can go. So they'll squat in different places. Yes. That's, you know, my only, con my only suggestion might be to have a, a period of time during the day where they are, they do have a specific area that they stay in, but I don't really. How old is she? I guess she's nine weeks now. So she's still little. Yeah. It could change. She's, uh, she's coming back to the center on Tuesday because I'm going to be out of town and can't extend her foster. But um, her, her medication will be finished by Monday. So that's good. You got your foot in my neck there. Um, I would also add, um, you know, it seems like she wants to try to go more. So maybe leave her outside for a little bit longer. Yeah. Um, let her try. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um and then once you get inside maybe move on to something else like maybe she gets a puzzle toy or something after she comes right. inside to keep her mind off of her uncomfortableness right stop thinking about going all the time <laughs> yeah <laughs> distraction it's a good one yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. I, don't, I don't it's i think it's 11 30 i don't know if julie had another mm -hmm. question but I don't know. I don't want to keep everybody all day long. I could talk about this till the end of time, but I'm sure you all have better things to do. <laughs> I can message separately after uh, so that everyone can jump off if you'd like. And I just want to put a plug in for, for Lindsay. The, the PowerPoint presentation was amazing. She did an awesome job. Oh, thank you. So I just wanted to say that. Um, Thanks, Lindsay. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Yes, thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you. Welcome. I could do it Thanks, again. Thanks, Lindsay. Me too, a million times. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.